Good afternoon, everyone. It is 1 p.m., so we will go ahead and get started. I am Dean Taifa, the Assistant Dean of Students for Diversity and Leadership Development at Wofford College. I also serve as a member of the Wofford College's 2021 virtual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee. As a committee, the Wofford College Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee has a social responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which Wofford currently exists. As a result, we acknowledge that we gather as an institution of higher learning on the ancestral lands of indigenous peoples, past and present, and honor with gratitude the land itself and thank enrolled members of the Cherokee Nation and their tribes for their involvement in helping the college learn more about the people who are stewards of the land Wofford currently occupies. We also acknowledge the enslaved Africans who labored to lay the physical foundations of the college. As a result, this committee commits to actively engaging in learning about the history of the lands we occupy, how to be better stewards of it, and continue to honor with intention and respect the historical and current significance of indigenous and enslaved peoples who suffered in the creation of the college and who are credited for its current existence. So thank you all today for joining our keynote address delivered by Dr. Shayla Nunnally, Professor of Political Science and Chair of the Africana Studies Program at the University of Tennessee, who I will formally introduce in a few moments. For those of you who aren't already familiar, the theme for this year's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration is keeping the same energy. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. In reflecting on the racial injustices and the losses that we all have experienced as individuals and as a collective community during 2020, it's paramount to highlight all that we have learned in the past year and commit to ensuring we keep the same energy by continuing to use the lessons we learned to contribute to a more equitable community, which Dr. King outlined in a lesser quoted section of the I Have a Dream speech as a community that, quote, reminds America of the fierce urgency of now that recognizes this is no time to engage in the luxury of cooling off or to take the tranquilizing drug of gradualism. Now is the time to, to make real the promises of democracy. And so nearly six decades after Dr. King's speech calling on the country to ensure every American was guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, on January 6, 2021, the bastion of American democracy, the US Capitol building was desecrated by white supremacists and insurrectionists. As the country and larger global community watched in despair, awe and terror, as nooses hung outside the US Capitol building, Confederate flags waved inside the hallowed halls, police officers beaten and killed, and our legislatures and their families feared for their lives, Many Americans thought to themselves, this isn't who we are. And that would have been a lie. As a lawyer, critical race theory scholar, and graduate of Georgetown Law, my legal expertise focuses on America's ongoing legal battle with racism. A battle that also intersects with the country's long history and train of abuses that include birtherism, xenophobia, classism, sexism, and a host of other phenomena that make it increasingly difficult for all of us to recognize, reconcile, and be held accountable for our past. And while the siege on the US Capitol building, a building I frequented as a baby lawyer, is reflective of our past, it doesn't have to be representative of our future. So today, Dr. Shayla Nunnally will highlight Dr. King's belief in the ability of American political institutions authority to facilitate democracy and racial equity while analyzing the possibility of that belief under the Biden-Harris administration. Shayla C. Nunnally is a professor of political science and chair of Africana Studies program at the University of Tennessee, where she will teach undergraduate and graduate courses in American politics and African-American politics, public opinion and political behavior. She is a summa cum laude graduate of North Carolina Central University she received her master's and PhD in political science at Duke University. Dr. Nunnally specializes in research on political social, socialization, 
racial socialization, trust, intergroup relations and attitudes, social capital, collective memory and memory transmission, Black American partisanship, Black political institutions, and African American political development. Her research has appeared in the Journal of Politics, Journal of Black Studies, Du Bois Review, Ralph Bunch, Journal of Public Affairs, Journal of African American Studies, Politics, Groups, and Identities, and several encyclopedias and edited volumes. She also has published a book with New York University Press, Trust in Black America, Race, Discrimination, and Politics. And her book was cited in an amicus carry brief to the US Supreme Court for the landmark affirmative action case Fisher v. University of Texas at Austin. Her current research projects focus on Black partisanship, Black interracial trust, Black elite queuing, and the political dynamism of Jim Crow Black public high schools in the state of Virginia. She is working on several book monographs and articles related to these subjects. Dr. Nunnally has appeared on several international, national, and local radio and TV shows, local and national to discuss American politics and race and politics. Dr. Nunnally has served as the 39th president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. She has served as the campus coordinator and director of the University of Connecticut's collaborative to advance equity through research on women and girls of color. She also is an inaugural editorial board member with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation's new journal, Journal of the Center for Policy Analysts analysis and research. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Nunnally. Before we officially begin, I do want to let our attendees know that we will be hosting a Q&A session immediately following Dr. Nunnally's remarks that will last up until 1.50. So please submit your questions as you have them so we can answer them during the Q&A portion of the program. And you can submit your questions using the Q&A feature. We will make every effort to answer as many questions as possible. However, we may not be able to get to every question. And as a final logistical note, in order to have a productive conversation, any attendee who is engaging in disrespectful, harassing or racist behavior will be removed from this session and all sessions going forward. And so at this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Nunnally. Thank you very much, Dean Taifa and greetings to you Walker community. It is such a pleasure to be able to join you this afternoon in honor and commemoration of Dr. Martin Luther King. I am honored to be able to join you. And again, thank you Dean Taifa and members of the MLK Celebration Committee for inviting me to join you today. The fact that I am able to join you during this moment in American history, a moment rife with political strife racial injustice and uncertain livelihood is serendipitous. I'm a scholar of American politics with a specialization in African-American politics and race and politics. And my inquiries of political phenomena have taken me from the examination of how black Americans learn about race and trust, participate in politics, think about political parties, advocate for black Americans' rights, resile during formal Jim Crow discrimination through forming voting movements and public high schools, and to today, proclaiming Black Lives Matter with an eye towards equalizing justice for Black people and all people around the world. As we are commemorating Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's legacy, we cannot do so in a vacuum. We must not extract Dr. King as a sole monumental figure who did not live in an environment that was hostile to him and the people who looked like him and who supported him and his cause, regardless of race. Rather, it is important for us to understand the context in which his leadership and activism occurred. And it is also important for us to contextualize Dr. King's life and journey in activism within the larger framework of American society and its theory of democracy. In light of all that has been troubling us in the past few weeks, especially, it is important for us to reflect upon who we are as a nation. That is why it is important for me to discuss with you today, democracy when, 
the perennial quest for the nexus between democratic theory and practice. We witness members of Congress challenging whether through rhetoric or formal debate, the election results of the states of Nevada, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Michigan, all states which have larger concentrations of non-white voters. We also witness the compromised security of our US Capitol with insurrectionists claiming what they thought was the steal of the US 2020 presidential election by electoral votes that had been certified by the various states. We saw white nationalists march down the streets of Washington, DC, some using deadly force to overcome law enforcement and besiege the offices and main floor of the Capitol where Congress conducts its business for the people. And it is the voice of the people about which I think we should take a moment to reflect upon what we saw happen now almost two weeks ago. What we saw was not the ramblings of a new age 1776 American Revolution. What we saw was a declaration of taking the nation back, making American great, but American, making America great with ellipses to the end of whiteness and white supremacy. It is this history that I would like to review to highlight all of what is important for thinking about the long history of the disjuncture between democracy and theory and practice in the United States. A disjuncture that cries for our minds and passions to seek a more perfect union for all people. First, we must begin with the birth of a nation. To start, this display of outright devotion to white nationalistic voices weighing more than non-whites has historic portrayal. However, the advancing force of opposition to the 2020 presidential election results was unprecedented in its magnitude to overtake in particular the US Capitol, disrupt Congress and the formal acceptance of the presidential electoral votes, and most importantly, attempt to reestablish the American presidency based upon prevarication about electoral fraud. Such exacting politics played out surreally for us will resemble some of the actions depicted in the 1915 film, Birth of a Nation by D.W. Griffith, who developed the film based upon the book, The Klansman by Thomas Dixon. Depicting what has now become the reference to the lost cause, when the American South lost its way of life, can slavery and plantation economy and opulence to the fault of the Union Army. Society was supposedly ravaged by reconstruction and a population of newly freed Black Americans who were empowered by the franchise, a concept that they were depicted not to understand, but were employed to use their franchise by Northern whites who wanted to reap their politics on white Southerners in order to overtake their Southern society. In the process, Black voters were even depicted as stuffing ballots and thusly casting ballots unfairly and cheating to win elections in the favor of the North and its political interests. From this, they were able to elect black politicians and these politicians ran amok like newly freed blacks who changed Southern etiquette such that whites were forced to assume the command of blacks and ultimately through political power, black men were able to make interracial marriages and hence interracial sex legal when it had not been. Thus why women were depicted as vulnerable to what was also depicted as the innate diabolical nature of black men who were portrayed as rapacious and greedy for white women. Slavery was depicted as necessary to tame the nature of black people, including even assertive black women who were depicted as best serving in the roles of domestics. In a world of reconstruction, whites were portrayed as being beholden to the power of blacks. And there was no end to the power the blacks would be willing to wield, other than one, the white hooded cavalry that swooped in to save the day, terrorizing blacks out of town, leaving whites to enjoy the peace of the southern way that they felt best comforted them. In film, the depiction of the negative racial stereotypes of black Americans occurred in blackface performance by white actors with burnt cork, blackened faces, who portray black 
and also Black actors themselves. This fiction film was believed to have been touted as being truthful by a son of the South himself and a noted scholar and past US president, Woodrow Wilson. Despite requests by the then nascent civil rights organization, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, founded in 1909, to denounce the film, even other protests by the NAACP for the film were not to be released. And despite that fact, it was. And as fearful as the NAACP was about the consequences of the film, it proved fateful. What was fictional became grasped as public knowledge about the lost cause of the American South and white Southerners. It reportedly helped build a major increase in membership in the Ku Klux Klan in the early 1900s. The film's believed calamitous effects led to it being banned in some places, evoking further questions of freedom of speech. Yet another amazing response in American history was the introduction of race films in the 1920s by black filmmaker Oscar Mischauer in an effort to produce and illustrate positive images of black Americans on film. This historic fake news and racist propaganda depicted in Birth of a Nation, however, portrayed blacks as happy slaves, inept without white leadership and enslavement, deceitful, innately criminal and rapacious, and most notably, ready to use their vote and new access to public office to assume leadership so that they could punish whites and will their black power to whites detriment. The film used imagery to concretize the image of black power at the behest of white Northern outside aggression, ravaging white Southerners quality of life. The South supposedly had no other choice but to redeem itself to its previous grandeur in slavery. When white plantation owners possessed land Black people were property and white landed interests exerted control over poor and non-landed whites to the benefit of an economy that supported white supremacy, the intersection of race and political economy. Black activists, notably William Monroe Trotter, an organization such as the National Equal Rights League and the NAACP, disputed with whites about the merits of the film and they staged protests across the country. Now over a hundred years old and noted as the first long feature film and one of the top cinematographic efforts in American film history, Birth of a Nation became a living and real nightmare last week as if it were textbook realism. Although the mostly black run government of Wilmington, North Carolina had been overthrown by a terroristic mob of white insurrectionists who installed themselves into power in 1898, and in 1921, now 100 years ago this year, the Tulsa, Oklahoma race riots unfolded with the beginnings of a reported white woman being sexually assaulted by a black man in an elevator, and supposed use of planes to bomb the black communities that occupied and owned properties that have now become known as the Black Wall Street, it is important for us to understand the making of falsehoods, distorted facts, negative racial stereotypes, racialized challenges to elections and electoral power, and racialized violence onslaught against people of color, whether symbolically or actually in the name of white supremacy and the notion of dominance in the name of purported popular sovereignty and American democracy. This is why it is important for us to understand the history of Southern redemption. This disfiguring thought and conception of democracy, however, undergirded the redemption of the American South through the American political party system at the conclusion of the American Civil War and the beginning and end of Reconstruction. American society had to figure out how it would be able to reunite after fissures over the question of states' rights to sustain slavery which even divided white families. Fissures between the North and the South or what was called sectional politics governed American politics well into the latter 20th century. Because black Americans, men in particular, acquired the right to vote via the 15th Amendment in 1870, 
and mostly supported President Abraham Lincoln's Republican Party, the anti-slavery party, their votes became deciding votes in many Southern elections, as white Southerners were often divided along the two parties. Black men voters thus held a balance of power, as it has been called, to determine elections. Black U.S. House of Representative member Joseph Rainey of South Carolina and Senator Hiram Revels of Mississippi were the first Black members to serve in Congress. Numerous other Black Congress members and state representatives were elected as Republican Party members during Reconstruction era. This is why it became important for Southern states to draft new state constitutions, beginning with the state of Mississippi in 1890, to introduce measures to disfranchise Black voters so that they could no longer determine representatives who had Black's interest in mind, as it was so believed. As it was at that time, Black interests often were conceived as anathema to white's interests because white supremacy translated into the subjugation of blacks by whites. This politics of disfranchisement of the black vote led to the lack of any black representation in Congress from 1887 through 1929. With the exclusion of black representatives, the politics of the time precipitated that Blacks' political interests were practically removed from Congress. A Republican Party that welcomed Black folks, however, soon turned into a party that was willing to relinquish the safety of Black Americans to win the votes of an electoral commission appointed by Congress to determine the breaking of a tie between Republican presidential candidate Rupert B. Hayes and Democratic candidate Samuel B. Tilden in 1876. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes agreed to a deal with the Southern Commissioners to remove federal troops from the American South and what is now referred to as the Compromise of 1877, which established the political and social context for the end of Reconstruction and the lack of security protections to protect Black Americans as citizens who could, through the ratification of the 13th Amendment to end slavery, and the 14th Amendment to provide for natural born citizenship, now vote and also govern their own person outside of a slavery oriented ideology, actually legally making claims about their bodies as free persons with citizenship rights, which they were able to manifest by way of the 15th Amendment. The making of space with no law enforcement to enforce these rights left Black Americans in the South especially vulnerable to the whims of whites who cling to white supremacy and denunciation of Black equality, social and political, and what that meant in comparison to whites. Jim Crow was born of an environment where lawlessness left unchecked and unsanctioned the behavior of whites who collectively across Southern states emboldened white supremacy by looking the other way when it came to democratic principles for blacks. These behaviors enforced by the rule of law that place whites supreme above non-whites and blacks in particular, making custom de facto practices as well, blacks not being able to bear witness against whites who committed offenses against them, all white juries upholding their Southern duty to hold whites not guilty of crimes committed against blacks and allowing extrajudicial violence to occur against blacks without law enforcement making arrests with law enforcement standing by or actually participating in egregious violence committed against blacks as we have seen footage even from the civil rights movement and the court of law ignoring and dismissing charges against whites who assailed black victims. Raw with impunity, the justice system, just like the signs affixed to restaurants, bus stations, and salons, and the exclusion of blacks from pools and even cemeteries, said whites only, with the US Constitution still governing our larger democracy. Democracy is not only what is conceived, it is also what is done. And not until even racial discrimination was banned in housing in 1968 with the Fair Housing Act did the gap between democratic theory and practice come closer to abridgment. 
when neighborhoods today still remain largely racially segregated. Even in the late 20th century, as even US presidential candidates tried to figure out how they could attract Southern and Midwestern white voters to their electoral support, we see that there is a party politics based upon race. Southern white voters have become long vested into the Republican Party after the fissure of the Democratic Party 100 years after the Civil War in 1964, which led to President Lyndon, which we see President Lyndon Baines Johnson advocated for both a Civil Rights Act for Blacks and other non-whites and a Voting Rights Act for Black and other non-whites in 1965. The 19th Amendment, which in 1920, the states ratified to promote women's voting rights, did not include the protections needed to ensure voting rights for non-white people. The once Democratic Party Solid South could no longer see itself with the National Democratic Party that after 1964 advocated for Black civil rights, making it even a new party of as many as 90% of Black Americans, even as we see reflected in today's politics. Many Southern states, white politicians, also bolted out of the Democratic Party after this policy shift in civil rights, and they aligned with the Republican Party. Many Southern states since then also supported Republican candidates for the American presidency. With what we have witnessed in American politics in the most recent several decades, we must consider how our lives and more recent racial injustices revisit, relive, and reconstruct or deconstruct white supremacy in America. How now has Jim Crow politics become our larger national politics of today? This is why we must consider the truth about race in America, discrimination embedded in institutions, laws, and science. Many among us who were born in the 1990s and 2000s may think that our nation is far removed from the politics that Dr. King, his colleagues and fellow rights, civil rights activists challenged American democracy to match its theory with its practices. But as I am a black woman born in the American South and under the age of 50, with parents also born in the American South, I'm a mere conversation away from the memories of parents who in different cities of Virginia grew up in Jim Crow and lived their formative years within the cultural practices, beliefs, knowledge, and laws of this institution, which limited their access to full citizenship with unencumbered voting rights liberty and justice. Jim Crow, however, is not decades removed from our contemporary society. It is in the breath of black and white Southerners and those who were alive, who were defined by yet another institution that has evolved over time to define every human body within its context. The idea, the concept, the psychology, the experience, the laws of race. Race in America is the truth that we must allow ourselves to understand how much it affects our lives and has done so for several centuries. And evolving over literal centuries, race has defined who is beautiful, knowledgeable, intellectual, workworthy, and horribly expendable. It has defined the making of the entire Western hemisphere. And it has defined how the color of our skins affects the way that our bodies are treated and the quality of life that our bodies experience in society. Namely, by way of the institution of slavery, which started among indigenous peoples in the new world and transitioned into the transatlantic slave trade of Africans during the 16th through 19th centuries, there was the making of an economy based upon race, gender, and class, which involved economic production, the political economy, of reproduction to produce African enslaved laborers with a system that defined the bodies of African people based upon their likelihood to produce the most labor over a lifetime. Through the institutionalization of both slavery and race in tandem, Africans in colonial America and what was to become the United States of America occurred within a 40 year period. 
Although Africans had a presence in the Americas prior to 1619, 1619 is the 400 sec second year history that marks the imbalanced experiences of Africans' labor compared to European debtors' behavior in the colonial American economy. We have learned more recently that Africans in 1619 were not 20 and some odd Negroes who were indentured servants. Rather, they were introduced early into what was the institution of slavery as they arrived on the shore of Fort Comfort, Virginia. By the 1640s, Africans were recognized as enslaved persons to the extent of the label being synonymous with their bodies. And while at one point, the assumption of Christianity could lead one towards freedom, within the same decade, the status of one as enslaved or free depended on the free or enslaved status of her African mother. Moreover, eventually by law, those who were deemed an enslaved and African were deemed so for a lifetime as an inheritance at birth, and thus was more easily traceable than following the patrilineage of fathers who also were European enslavers who reproduced their wealth through duress and rape of African and African descended women who were considered property. This is the horrid history of what slavery also represented. This is also why it is important to note that the making of who was enslaved and the attachment of who was also considered black also entail the making of a binary that defined people of European descent as white and those of African descent as black. These binaries were most stringent and lasting over time as indigenous people's populations differed by geographic concentration. Class and gender defined access to rights of European descendants and European descendants without land and who were women had limited political power, voice and franchise in colonial America. Through what became their empowerment of the agreed to distinguish themselves and reform government to break free from the reign of King George III of England to ignite the Revolutionary War in 1776, already a century and a few decades defined how Europeans, Africans, and indigenous people interacted with one another. And yet the first casualty of this revolution was a patriot fighting for the cause of freedom. Crispus Attucks, who also was a person of African descent. While the nation defined and ratified part of our contemporary US constitution in 1787, it is important to note that it does not mention race, nor does it mention slavery. However, we find that there were several instances within the US constitution prior to the Civil War that address what would be the operations and implicit legalization of slavery as an institution. One, the Three-Fifths Compromise, affecting the apportionment of representatives and presidential elect electors in the Electoral College in Article One, Section Two, thusly defining the bodies of persons who were enslaved according to this count of three-fifths a person. Two, the inhibition to decide on servitude prior to 1808 as found in Article One, Section Nine. Three, the inhibition to change the year 1808 in the decision of law about slavery in Article 5. And four, the Fugitive Slave Clause, Article 4, Section 2, returning by legal observance persons who were in service or labor. These legal prescriptions for enslaved persons did not define race, but through practice, the enslaved person became synonymous with people of African descent. Moreover, it inhibited the liberties of persons of African descent who were free as they had to prove by legal documentation on their person, whether they were indeed manumitted or enslaved persons. In whiteness being constructed as a negation of blackness, the oppressive subjugation of African enslaved persons also constructed the foundational freedoms, liberty, and wherewithal of white supremacy. The Naturalization Act of 1790 defined free citizenship based on white persons. And over the next 150 years, the citizenship of non-white persons was defined by the distinctive racial experiences of each non-white group over time. For example, only through the American Civil War would people of African descent acquire access to natural born citizenship. Indigenous people would, have access, would not have access to citizenship until 1924. 
And despite some ethnic groups among Asian Americans and Latinx Americans, principally Mexican Americans, had been in the United States for several generations for ha before having their fullest access to citizenship via legislation like the Naturalization and Immigration Act of 1965. Meanwhile, laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Immigration Quota Act of 1924 converge in their barring access to citizenship for Asian Americans. Blood quantum, or drops of blood, eventually also define who was Black and who was Indian. As for Blacks, the states use different fractions, one fourth, one eighth, one thirty second, one drop of African blood to define who was Black. And this also defined the way that people lived their lives. Thusly, people were even referred to as being quadrillions, one-fourth black, octillions, one-eighth black. Again, making sure that they followed the lives of people of African descent and all of the discrimination that it presented. For government agencies, indigenous peoples have had to use fractions of blood to have government recognition and sovereignty status. For blacks living in the American South, when these fractions by law also interrupted how one would follow Jim Crow laws, moving across state lines could redefine one's lack of citizenship and quality of life, similar to moving across free and slave states like decades before in the case of Dred Scott, the enslaved black man who sought his freedom in the US Supreme Court because he had moved to a free state. In denying Dred Scott his humanity, the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger Taney, himself a slave owner, told Dred Scott in the famous Dred Scott v. Sanford 1857 case that at the time of the Declaration of Independence, Blacks as slaves nor their descendants, whether they had become free or not, were then acknowledged as a part of the people nor intended to be included in the general works used in that memorable instrument. And as Taney said further, Negroes as they were so called, were of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relation, and so far inferior that they had no rights for which the white man was bound to respect. The pseudoscience of race and inheritable traits being connected contributed to our medical knowledge about racial difference. And through the white supremacist lens of defining social order and human evolution, Black Americans and other non-white racial groups were detached from their intellect, comportment, and humanity. This is why legal originalism of the US Constitution, as it was understood in the context of its writing, also can be problematic. Or if we were to turn to this principle, we would be considering the interpretation of people, non-white, women, non-binary, and the various iterations whose personhood had not yet been acknowledged or even attributed as having the possibility of citizenship or rights. And all non-whites have this track record of exclusion from this rule of law until court cases or laws prescribed either their humanity, citizenship, or equality. These aspects of academic enterprise and inquiry, inquiry stemmed from the 18th century enlightenment period and lasted through the latter part of the 19th century, a two century pseudo informed knowledge base about human development. Carrying over into the 20th century, the pseudoscience informed the basis of eugenics that used the links among race, blood, and heredity to inform public policies to control human reproduction through sterilization, population, and demographic control, and attributions of criminality to the existence of non-white populations. This pseudoscience informed our intellectual understandings about human behavior and its capacities and limitations especially in non-white populations. It also defined a science and body of knowledge of others, which made whiteness defined as a negation of all that was explained and known to be attributed to people of color. Our public policies and laws divided the American public along racial lines, and our purported pseudo-knowledge informed the psychology of racism, negative racial stereotypes, and racial animus that rest with and divides us along the color line even today. The media have been contrite in ad advertising runaway slave ads, publishing alarming reports of racial stereotypic behavior of non-whites, harping on criminality and excluding positive media about non-white groups, all to the initial equivalent of what was real 
fake news for centuries. Wherein the contributions of non-white groups have been mostly eliminated from public knowledge, had been mostly uh, eliminated from public knowledge and left to the lore and ethnic consciousness of these groups to challenge what they knew happened to them and what they knew contributed to American society. It is important for us also to recognize the significance of our textbooks. Having eloquently omitted the contributions of non-white peoples to the making of America's greatness, in effect, contributing to the mythology that white people alone have built America. Newer acknowledgement, the contributions and significance of non-white people and democracy. Enslaved African people only within the past eight years, 2012 to be exact, have been formally recognized by a commemorative marker for actually erecting the U.S. Capitol, and the multiple cogwheels of streets that people follow in Washington, D.C. today were designed by Benjamin Banneker, a Black American genius scientist and inventor who even marveled Thomas Jefferson as he spoke about what were, was the importance of rights for enslaved African people. In a similar story of my alma mater, Duke University, Julian Abel, a Black American contributed as a chief designer of the beautiful Gothic West Campus in the mid 1920s, only to have been overlooked purposefully in public recognition for the tremendous contribution that he made to the campus. This being disclosed only more recently in public acknowledgement in the 1980s. We see continually that there are references to black Americans, to people of color, all of their experiences, even what is the experience of, for example, Me Mexican Americans in the Southwest region of the United States, having had the border placed on them and their citizenship denied, despite provisions in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And that generations of Asian Americans, Chinese Americans notably, being brought to the nation for labor to mine coal and to build a railroad um, helped connect what was the East and West railroads. Our nation also grew and expanded based upon free and slaveholding states. We even see that what were these economies of the Western hemisphere that over time were fed by what were the laws that protected slavery also were protected, as I mentioned before, by news and media and enforcements and reinforcements of racial frenzies that also limited the free speech of people of color and not printing their perspectives. We see what was a United States Postal Service that also was complicit in delivering postcards of actual lynchings with smiling white bystanders, men, women, and children. The projects of empire and imperialism span the world to acquire US territories deeming the people unfit to ungovern themselves as also people of color, while also promoting democracy and being the beacon of hope for their supposed civilization and civility. I share this information as an anecdotal backdrop for us to think about how we understand the history of democracy in the United States. A representative democracy based on the will of the people, most notably what we call popular sovereignty. Who are citizens? How are the voices of citizens most notably heard? They are heard through casting a vote at the ballot box. And depending upon the office in which we are electing a representative, our votes are mostly counted as a plurality of those cast to determine a representative unless otherwise noted as in the electoral college. Yet access to the ballot has not been one that has been accessible to all. Of what I describe as a test over time, to move our democracy towards a more perfect union. This is why in thinking about what is the violence that we witnessed more recently and what is the presence of America and all of what America has represented. Democracy is a part of our foundation, but we also must be mindful of what that violence has looked like in the past in the civil rights movement to shape what was a protest movement 
in peace that also attempted to contest what was the adamant opposition of Black Americans and other groups to have access to democracy. This is why who we were, who we are, and who do we want to become is important. Diversity is who we are and actually who we have been. Inclusive is what we can become and must be. Supremacism is what can be diminished, undone, and unforgotten so that we can plan for a future with the best minds who have access to the most opportunities because they were not systemically excluded by a concept. White supremacy, which defines a way of life for all people across every social identity imaginable, and yet deprives us of the innovation, thought, talent, and labor that is constructed as being invaluably conceived as whites only. It is through understanding that the exclusion of white supremacy can lead us further towards equality, towards democracy. And this is why to this end, I ask democracy when? Is it now? Is it the return to an undemocratic, miserable, violent and romanticized past that forgets the ravagement of culture, thought, neighborhoods, educations, lands and lives of non-white peoples? Or is it a future that we can collectively and diversely conceive to make a more perfect union for us all and not just some? Think democracy when, and think democracy for humankind. Think about how we must re-educate ourselves to unlearn the half-truths and untruths that have distorted our understandings of what is America. At what point will we make this view, this living, this understanding, a pluribus unum without white supremacy at its helm? We are reminded of Dr. King's words as we turn to his speech in 1967, The Other American. I sincerely advise you to look at that speech and all of what it represents as far as even being prescient as to the politics that we have witnessed most recently. But in conclusion, to this question of democracy when, I say, democracy when, we acknowledge and mandate education about slavery and Jim Crow and their vestiges and their effects on every aspect of American society. The admission and readmission of states, education, politics, political parties, housing, health, banking, criminal justice, law enforcement, music, art, culture, labor, and the economy. Democracy when we acknowledge and educate about intersectionality and experiences of all people in the United States and what effects it has, has on people's quality of life. Democracy when, when we acknowledge years of data that report racial disparities and disproportionate effects and move forward with the will to move beyond race-based innate explanations of human behavior to acknowledge centuries of institutions, policies, pseudo-knowledge and learning and attitudes that undergird inequalities. Democracy when we acknowledge years of data that report racial disparities and disproportionate effects and redress them with institutions and public policies in committed ways similar to what Reconstruction offered the Black population upon its acknowledgement of humanity and its citizenship. Democracy when we acknowledge that democracy is incomplete without the accessibility of all eligible voters to participate. Democracy when we acknowledge that we have to unlearn ourselves and that undoing white supremacy does assume a unique responsibility of white Americans who can not only be allies, but also activists in sanctioning other white Americans who cling to white supremacy in places of decision-making and everyday life in public and private spaces. Democracy when we are willing to see that citizenship, voting, participation, and humanity are accessible to all people without white supremacy, because white supremacy damages, damages us all from being the great humans that we can be by selecting on an idea that assumes that the best in all talent comes from only one race. The exclusions about who we are as a nation and have been only damages us. It is up to us to speak up and challenge what we have been gaslighted about in our understandings of the United States. 
We are great as the U.S., but us together and not without them. It is only with an overhaul of what we were and currently manifest that we can lay bare and be the best of our tomorrows and our future generations. Thank you, Wofford College community. Thank you. And remember what President Dr. Sammy embraced as a strategic vision for the university. It's our Wofford. It's your Wofford and your community can be at the helm of justice and racial justice. My sincerest best to you in these efforts, especially as we commemorate Dr. Martin Luther King. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nunnally, for those insightful remarks and for reminding us, as Dr. King said, that we must accept finite disappointment, but we must never lose infinite hope. And so thank you for that. And so we're now at the point where we can take a question or two. And right now there aren't any in the chat. Uh, so I'll give it a few more seconds. But as we close today's session, I would like to thank or take this time to uplift my colleagues of the Wofford College 2021 Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee for their efforts in this year's celebration. So that would include Ian Brown, Dr. Begonia Caballero, Bree Dugan, Angela Filler, Isaiah Franco, Nadia Glover, Dr. Boyce Lawton, Marshall McDill, De'Aaron McGowan, Sarah Milani, Olivia Miller, Kia Kaiser, Titasia Robinson, Lee Smith, Dr. Tasha smith Tyus, Jessalyn Story, and James Stoops. And so before we head out, I did want to also take this time to allow our student leaders to remind us of the dream we're all seeking to achieve. And so I will do that now. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, and so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with this vicious racist, with this governor having his lips dripping with the word of interposition and nullification. One day, right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low. The rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and the flesh shall see it together. This is our hope, and this is the faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of this mountain of despair a stone of hope. And with this faith, we'll be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we'll be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we'll be free one day. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside, let freedom ring. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. And this will be the day. This will be the day 
when all of God's children will be able to sing with new meaning. And so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. From every mountainside, let freedom ring. Let freedom ring from the heightening allegiances of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and molehill of Mississippi. And when this happens, and we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty we are free at last. And so in celebration of Dr. King's life and legacy, we're continuing to honor him through events that will take place through this Saturday. And so today at 2.30, we're hosting a discussion on Finding Common Ground, which will be led by Expert National Coalition Building Institute or NCBI leader, Beverly Williams, alongside our very own Wofford NCBI trainer, Sarah Milani, Ben Spays, and Toria Teamer. Also tonight, the city of Spartanburg is hosting the annual Unity Celebration at 6.30, which will be held virtually on the city's Facebook page. And then at 7.30, the Iota Pi Sigma Chapter of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated is hosting a virtual interest meeting for interested men. And so today is just a reminder of the commitment and the energy that we need to keep throughout, not just this week, but all year long. And so before we leave, there is one question, uh, Dr. Nunnally. And so the question is, should appropriation be on the table for racial justice? If yes or no, why? And do you think MLK would be concerned about renaming monuments, which I believe has been the focus of those in power now? Um, so as far as appropriation, I want to make sure that I understand appropriation as um, the person asking the question is inquiring. Is that to suggest that can different, can people of different races make claims about racial justice? Just want to make sure I'm understanding that. As far as appropriation of voice, um, is it that you're asking about who should make certain claims? Um, and I ask that too, because I think what is important about the conversation about race today is that we should be asking uh, these questions about race and also making sure that we're thinking about the significance of white supremacy. And this is where I think we have not been as honest in many instances in our more recent conversations about what is race in America, that it's not just race discrimination, but how is it that white supremacy defines what is racial discrimination? What does it mean for then voices, certain voices to make claims, but that unfortunately, as those voices of, for example, people of color are making those claims, they may not be perceived with the same weight and voice of people who are white. So again, what that means for uh, racial appropriation I try to sort through what um, the person inquiring the question was asking. I, I hope that that offered some, um, some thought about the significance of voice and weight of voice and what it means to have access to the public sphere, which now social media has given that voice to a larger platform of people to make claims that otherwise may have even been excluded from the media and the larger media as I even discussed today. And this point about renaming of monuments, based on your professional opinion and your scholarship, how do you feel Dr. King would have come down on one side or the other in reference to renaming of buildings or not? I'm, I'm really um, reflecting on that one. 
And I say that because I think that King would want us to be mindful of those persons who were pretty much, um, I guess, valorized and esteemed in the ways that they were, but that he would want us to do that in a way that we also acknowledge what is the context of those persons' actions, that we should not forget those persons. And I think he may, he may su support the renaming. And I think that is because also that in renaming, it's a way to move forward and acknowledging that that was something that was wrong. It was a, that you have people representing a politics that was against the full rights of people. And that that is something that should not occur again, but that again, should be remembered. Well, thank you, Dr. Nunnally, for that response. And thank you for all of our attendees who were in session with us today. And I really do encourage you to take a look at the events that are taking place this week and um, to attend as many as you can. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Nunnally. It was a professional pleasure and honor to learn from you today. Thank you, and thank you, Walker community. My sincerest best to you.